Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to one of our uh, Hobby Memorial Library events. We have our amazing partners over here from Fort Hood. We've got um, Tanika Avila, the Environmental Protection Specialist over here. And then we also have Christine Luciano. She is the Environmental Outreach Coordinator, and they're going to talk today all about stormwater and pollution. So I'm excited about this and people have been talking about this. So we are ready and just go ahead and take it away. Well, Cindy, we really do appreciate the opportunity to educate the CTC campus and anyone that we can connect with virtually. So with the Forehead Environmental Division, we're going to look at more of the bigger picture of what stormwater is and what things, initiatives that individuals can do within their community at their home to help do an impact. And then we're going to concentrate more about what Nika and her team are doing at Fort Hood um, to help with stormwater pollution prevention. So let's get our slide deck started. Do you see the slide deck on your end? Oh, let's see. Alyssa, do they have um, the presenter role? Oh, there I we think go. we're going. I think it was an operator error yeah, we, on we my part. We just made it really, you know, hard for you. <laughs> you no, no, no. Definitely me. So we're from the Fort Hood Environmental Division, and this week is actually Pollution Prevention Week. So it's hosted the third week of September. Um, it was an initiative that was kickstarted by the Environmental Protection Agency, and it's just to promote individuals to do their part to be greener, um, whether it's conserving water, uh, energy, or just reducing their waste and going back to the three R's that we have taught our kids to reduce, reuse, and recycle. So all of these initiatives really add up to help out with pollution prevention. And it just shows that we all can do our part um, to have less of um, a, a car less carbon footprint in the environment um, and just be more impactful of what we can do to be good stewards of the environment. So to get started, and we just want to get individuals more aware of what exactly what is stormwater. And just simply put, stormwater is water runoff from storms. So when it rains and we have that water coming to the environment, you might ask yourself, well, what happens with all this rain uh, when it falls into the ground? You know, it may land on a tree and evaporate. It may land in an open field and just soak into the ground or it may land on a rooftop, a driveway way or road and end up in a storm drain. So the impact of that storm water, whether it's a natural landscape, it will absorb more naturally into the environment uh, and then become groundwater. But with precipitation in an urban and suburban area, that doesn't evaporate as efficiently and might not just soak into the ground because we have those those concrete pads, those driveways. And so and it also determines depends where is the closest storm drains for that storm water runoff to end up to. So in these landscapes, when storm water falls onto paved surfaces like streets and driveways, they don't allow for the water to soak into the ground. And this just increases the amount of water that's going to your area lakes. And for us, we have Lake Belton and Stillhouse Lake in our local area. So what's the problem with storm water? You know, you're getting this water, you think, hey, it's gonna be beneficial to the environment and everything. Well, when storm water flows over paved areas, it's collecting everything out in the environment. And unfortunately, when you go outside, you can look and you'll see some animal waste, some type of piece of litter, you know, we're wanting maybe green yards. So there's could be use of pesticides and fertilizer into the environment. If you're doing any type of maintenance on your vehicle, oil, grease, um, sediment, all those items can be collected from that stormwater. 
And as it's traveling to the storm drains and ending up into a waterway, it can impact and pollute the water. So unlike wastewater, stormwater is not treated. It's not clean before it enters the lakes. So think about that. When you're swimming out at Lake Belton or Stillhouse Lake, think about where that water came out before. So we want people to have the bigger picture and we don't think that necessarily people understand how those mechanics work with stormwater. It doesn't go into a storm drain, doesn't go through a magical process of getting clean or anything like that. It goes to a storm drain to end up into the bigger bodies of water like Lake Belton. So, with that, you can have environmental problems. And this is a really great description to highlight all the impacts that we can have within our household environment, from our vehicles to the pet waste to the fertilizer. And this just illustrates it's just going to go into the storm drain and directly into the waterways. So, you know, some of the additional problems that we can have with stormwater is that stormwater runoff can erode stream banks. It can damage hundreds of miles of aquatic habitat. It can push excess nutrients from these items, these pollutants um, right into the river. And so when you have items like pet waste, you know, don't think that because you have pet waste, hey, it's poop, it's fertilizer, it's like manure. No, that pet waste can actually be a grow for algae blooms and then create low oxygen dead zones. So that's impacting the aquatic life. And we've heard local in the news about algae blooms with our local waterways and the impact that can have also on our pets. So you gotta think about how the domino effect can happen with the decisions that we make at home, in the environment, in our workplace. One of the other challenges is sediment, dirt. That is one of the largest pollutants um, with storm water. And so as that sediment gets into the environment, it blocks the sunlight. So all these can also lead to um, what storm water runoff. You can also have challenges with flooding. So forests, wetlands, and other vegetation areas can trap water and pollutants and slow down that flow. But when we have urban areas and we have pay bears where that water can't get absorbed into the environment. It just kind of collects and we don't have any type of natural buffer to slow it down. So we're going to talk about some things that you can also do to help minimize that impact uh, with the environment. So <clears throat> I think it's really interesting to talk about litter and just look at the facts at the bigger picture. So the Texas Department of Transportation has a program where they partner with Keep Texas Beautiful, and it's called the Don't Mess with Texas Trash Off. As part of that campaign, they highlight different facts, and maybe we just don't think about how a cigarette butt that someone throws out of their vehicle or an apple core or banana uh, peel, you know, how all those little things can truly add up. So we want to talk about some of the, the litter facts. So to think about it, out of all the Texas roadways, average about 362 million pieces of litter on the highways. And 71% of that trash are considered as micro litter. So they're either like two inches and smaller. So that's your cigarette butts, your straws, your gum wrappers, all those little things truly add up. So any type of item that is discarded out of your vehicle counts as trash, as litter. So don't think that, hey, I have some type of fruit product. I have an apple core, an orange peel, banana peel. I just threw it out into the environment. It's going to just naturally compost and biodegrade and go back and provide nutrients. No, there's a process to that, and that is still litter. So we just want people to think about, you know, if everybody thinks it's just something little, all those little actions truly add up, whether that is a positive impact or a negative impact. So just rethink about what you can do to help minimize that litter. So unfortunately, we have individuals that just don't do the right thing. 
So with technology, um, don't mess with Texas, Texas Department of Transportation has come up with an app. So if you see a litter bug within the community, you just take down some information. Now you don't wanna do this while you're driving. So you shouldn't be operating your cell phone and downloading the app and inputting information. So just you know, take a note, a mental note, or if you have a passenger with you, ask them to record some information. So whether a piece of litter is just thrown out of the vehicle or is it just flies out, whether it's intentional or accidental, you can take some information down and you can input it in this app. So they try to make it as user friendly as possible. So you can either do a manual entry or you can do a voice submission. And so when you input this, you'll say, hey, where did the piece of trash come from? Was it the driver that threw it out? Was it the passenger? Maybe they had a truck and they just didn't realize they had some trash in the back and it flew out while they're driving. And then what type of product was it? Was it cigarette butts, fast food, maybe a Coke can, or maybe it was just something miscellaneous. So you wanna input all this information on here. So what happens is that you also record the driver's, the vehicle's information. So you wanna input what the license plate number is, um, the type of vehicle, and so based on what the registration information is, in a few weeks, like two to three weeks, the individual actually receives a trash bag. And it says, you know, don't mess with Texas. And it just encourages them to not be a litter bug. So you can submit this, it is confidential. They won't be able to like, hey, I'm gonna go on the app and figure out who sent my information and said that I was a litter bug. So they would never find out who it was that submitted the information. So, you know, each state might have something similar, something unique. So we encourage you to see what those resources are and then look at your state's, you know, Department of Transportation to get some insight about the programs and just the facts, just to see the bigger picture of what the impact is like. So one of the initiatives that with uh, TxDOT, with the Texas Department of Transportation, and with Keep Texas Beautiful, so they have a huge initiative called Don't Mess With Texas Trash Off. So it is a month long litter cleanup event. So throughout the month of April, they encourage communities, and this can be communities, school groups, or it can just be a family event um, that you gather together anytime and just do a, a cleanup event to, to promote litter prevention. So, um, if you reach out to Keep Texas Beautiful on their website, you can register an event and then they will provide you trash bags, gloves, they'll provide you some information, resources to help with the litter cleanup event. So they're trying to provide you the tools and then when you're out there, you're further educating and creating a positive impact. So explore those resources and this is something that students of any ages whether you're a two-year-old or your grandma and grandpa, any individual can go out there to help make an impact. Um, you know, Tanika and I were at an educational event a couple of years ago at an elementary school when we helped with doing a beautification and litter cleanup event. And then on the next day, there was a community-wide event. So think about how you can work together collectively. So, you know, it was amazing to see this group of elementary students collaborating with soldiers, with uh, the local motorcycle group, all working together. And they collected, I believe it was more than 300 pounds of trash and litter within their school's footprint. And they just went also around their, their the community. So some of the volunteers, I believe the youngest volunteer we had there was two years old. So if you're moving and walking, you can do your part to help out uh, with the environment, even if you're crawling or rolling too. So one of the other initiatives that has kind of picked up is an activity called plogging. So, you know, I I think this was something, you know, that individuals have been doing a while. There wasn't a term um, that was associated with it. So there was a gentleman named Eric Ostrom from Stockholm, Sweden. In 2016, he came up with a site called Plaga, which was an idea that means to pick up. 
So plaga and jogging went together to create plogging. So the concept is to encourage individuals to get outdoor, to explore, and while you're jogging, to try to help do your part with the environment. You know, wherever you go, unfortunately, you'll see some type of piece of litter. And so you can kind of make it a full body workout, go out, have a trash bag with you. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to be jogging. You could be walking, you can be hiking. Um, and while you're having that, you know, it's a full body workout. So you're squatting, um, you're doing st different stretches to collect that litter. Um, and then you're helping out with the environment. So, you know, it's releasing happy endorphins. So this was a really great visual to highlight different um, steps you can take so that you can prepare for your plogging adventure. So, you know, have a bag, kind of try to do an assessment of where you can dispose of that bag of, of trash that you collect. You know, be prepared to be a little dirty, maybe have a set of gloves with you. You want to make sure you're wearing comfortable shoes. You don't want to be wearing sandals if you're going on a long adventure. And just kind of think about the route that you're taking, um, figuring out how you're going to dispose of that. And then, you know, make it a social event. Get your friends or your family together. So um, one of the a beautiful site that we have in this area is Miller Springs Park. So the boundary of that park is um, between Belton and Temple. So it, it's within those two communities. And the city of Belton quarterly hosts uh, a trash cleanup event. So it's a great opportunity to just be in this um, green landscape area uh, with natural trails, but also help out. So I think at the last event that we went to, we collected cans and glass bottles and just looking at the, the signage and um, the marketing material and design, we saw that some of these items were 60, 75 years old. And, you know, with glass, you know, there was no impact. Of course, with aluminum cans, they had rusted and had gotten a little thinner. But we, we want people to think about, you know, again, with the micro litter, if it's coming out of your vehicle, that goes out into the roadways, it can eventually go into the waterways and have an impact with that. When you're going into this beautiful landscape, that glass bottle, if we didn't pick that up, they say glass can take a million years to, to decompose, to break down. So we try to tell people, hey, if all these individuals are throwing their glass bottles and their trash, we don't want to be able to have our children exploring or digging in dirt. And the next thing you know, they find trash in their backyard or out in the green, what's supposed to be a green space. So, you know, Make this a fun adventure because we all have a responsibility uh, to do our part to help out with the environment. So these are just ways that you can get creative and help out too. So some additional things that we want individuals just to be aware of how they can minimize their impact with storm water pollution. So, you know, um, some people do their own vehicle maintenance on their vehicles. And we just want to keep in mind that, you know, when you're maintaining your truck or your car, be aware of any type of leaks that you might have and, and fix those immediately. You want to make sure if you're doing any type of maintenance that you never want to dump any of that product down a storm drain. You know, look for opportunities where you can recycle your used oil, your antifreeze and other fluids. I know individuals in our area, if you go to an automotive store like AutoZone or Vance Auto Parts or Riley's, they have an opportunity where you can recycle your used oil. Or if you're on Fort Hood, we have a unique facility called the Classification Unit, and it's a year-round service where we provide the opportunity for individuals with Department of Defense IDs to properly dispose of these items. Another really great initiative it's also through our local Central Texas Council of Governments, and they partner with each of the communities um, in the Central Texas region to host that household uh, cleanup, household turn-in event. So that also becomes another opportunity. So explore your municipality to see if there is a program or service that they have available for you to dispose of those used um, maintenance products, 
or if there's something maybe at an automotive store in your area that provides that opportunity. Another way that you can minimize your impact is to wash your car, you know, over a lawn or gravel. So we talked about that water, those products, when you're going onto a paved surface, nothing is slowing down, it's just going straight into the storm drain. So when you use a lawn or a gravel space, instead that allows an opportunity for it to be absorbed into the ground, um, to neutralize the soap, the products that are you're using. And maybe when you're using your products, you know, try to rethink some greener decisions, maybe consider something that's maybe non-toxic type of soap, something that would be better for the environment. Or the other thing is to explore using a commercial car wash where that wastewater is recycled and is treated. Another opportunity to explore is to drive less, you know, leave your car at home, um, maybe explore carpooling or just going outdoors and walking or enjoying a bike ride if you're trying to go someplace a short distance. Um, you can also cut down on fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. Uh, you don't, and you definitely don't want to fertilize after rainstorm. So, you know, kind of be on the lookout for weather.com or use your tools and ask Alexa if we have a storm coming up around the corner. Or, you know, consider using organic alternatives um, that might be less, less impactful. If you're on a septic system, make sure you do your part to maintain that system. If you have a leaking system, you have that harmful bacteria that can end up in the storm sewer systems on local waterways. And then it can just be costly if you delay. So, you know, it's a it can be a financial burden and also an environmental uh, significant Im negative impact. And then the other um, item you can do is to reduce impervious surfaces at home and increase the vegetation land cover of your property. Um, you know, we were recently in another town this past weekend, uh, Tanika and I, and they were talking about how their community was providing some grants to residents to actually to not have um, grassy areas. Um, to have more native air, uh, plants and everything, to not have like the paved cements and every, so that it could help with these initiatives. So the other item, and we briefly mentioned this um, before also was pet waste. You know, why do I have to scoop my dog's poop? Why can wildlife poop outside, but my dog can't? And can I use my dog waste as fertilizer? Well, you know, it's important to scoop your dog's poop and dispose of it properly. Um, you know, it's really great that a lot of the local communities, if you go to a park, they have the little poop bags or, you know, there's a Oktoberfest or uh, a dog friendly event. They provide you little tools to kind of help you on your venture. So you want to have like a little bag with you um, to pick up your dog's poop because that waste has parasites, um, like ringworm, salmonella, E. coli. Um, and then, you know, this was a really interesting fact that one gram of dog waste can contain up to 23 million fecal coliform bacteria. And then can just cause a slew of other health issues. So think about that. We don't want to have that in our drinking water um, that can impact us. So, you know, we don't want any of these um, pathogens to go into these bodies of water and then make it unfit for, you know, having recreational opportunities with swimming, having our families out there, um, and then our, our fur babies too. So why can wildlife poop outside, but my dog can't? You know, well, wildlife and birds, they eat what is found outside in the natural environment, um, you know, with plants, insects, and other wildlife and as they digest they extract some of those nutrients uh, from those sources and anything that cannot use leaves their body and feces and urines so this means that native wildlife are using nutrients from their home and returning those unused nutrients back to the original environment and when you have pet food what we feed our animals that's nutrition healthy but that doesn't originate from the area that those pets live so, no, you can't use your dog waste as a fertilizer. Um, it can be harmful, just as what we just mentioned earlier about why you gotta scoop up your dog's poop.
Okay. Yeah. So the other item that we talked about is, you know, um, sediment is also a large pollutant for, for storm water. You know, when it's loose and you have that soil, um, you can have issues with erosion and that just removes the dirt and soil and rock from one location and just moves it into another location. So you have activities that can disturb the land and create this and make it happen more frequently, um, which can also lead to water pollution. So, you know, how the sediment pollute creeks, streams, and lakes? Well, it can fill up our storm drains and carry that rain away, increasing the potential for flooding. Um, it can make the water cloudy, prevent animals like fish and birds being able to see their food. And um, that cloudy water can kill plants that live in water and prevent new plants from growing in the water. It can also clog the gills of fish, making it difficult for them to breathe. And then fish may avoid areas that have too much sediment. So it is a domino effect of what the, that impact can be. So one of the things that you can do to help minimize is to consider using native low maintenance plants and grasses. So if you're in the Central Texas area, these are highlights of some native flowers, native grasses, native shrubs that you can use. And when we say native, native plants are items that occur naturally into a particular region. So these plants are less labor intensive, they're water efficient for the landscape, and they're beneficial uh, to homeowners and the environment. So when you have an invasive plant, a uh, plant that's not supposed to be here, that's an exotic species, it might have the ability to thrive, but it will spread aggressively and can have a detrimental impact to other plants that are native to this area and also to wildlife. So plants are the first defense when it comes to erosion control and storm water management. So understanding the, the plant species uh, susceptibility to water level fluctuations and landscape pollutants will help you to have a better storm water retention treatment and it will be aesthetically pleasing and then it will just attract natural pollinators, whether it's birds, bees, bats and butterflies into uh, your environment. One of the other things that you consider when you're having native plants is you can consider a rain garden when you're doing your landscaping um, that's best adaptable for your, your area. Um, so that will be more resistant also to pests and diseases uh, and also provide shelter and food for native plants. So one of the things that we came across that you might want to consider if you're doing like an assessment of your footprint, it's maybe considering a rain garden. So if you look at the, the visual in the middle, you see where it dips down. So, you know, a rain garden is a planted shallow depression that collects the rainwater from roofs, parking lots, and other services. It can blend into a landscape and serve as a garden area, and its main function is to retain and treat collected stormwater. The rain gardens also are known as bioretention areas. So they're either a bowl shape or surrounded by berms to retain that water, and they're planted with native plants. Um, the rainwater gradually soaks into the soil and nourishes those plants in the garden, and then those plants filter and absorb any pollutants so clean water is soaked back into the group. So it's this natural process. So you don't have to water them because these are native plants. Uh, it creates an, a diverse habitat for birds and butterflies, and then it just keeps those pollutants out of the groundwater. So if you're in the area and you have access onto Fort Hood, we have um, a natural garden that can provide you some ideas. And this isn't, like I said, with these native plants, there's minimal um, care that you have to do with watering because they're uh, adaptable to this area. So, you know, in the springtime, it's gorgeous. And it's called the Burr Bee Bat Butterfly Garden. So it's a little bit of a tongue twister, but you know, this is a, um, a year round facility that we have. And we also have a nature trail that provides some learning opportunities for you to just be more knowledgeable about the native plants in the area that you see and give you some ideas of what you can do um, at your home. 
So the other item that we want to highlight too is to, to minimize uh, pollution. It's the items that we find underneath our sink, in our garage, or in the shed. So these are everyday items that you use around your house, and they can potentially be hazardous, you know, to your family, to your pets, to wildlife, to the environment. And it's important to keep in mind that, hey, when I'm done with this, or maybe I didn't like this product, that you just don't put it in the trash. Because again, that can end up in the environment and have a negative impact. So, you know, especially products that are labeled poisonous, toxic, corrosive, or flammable, you want to explore what are the best opportunities to dispose of those items. So what do you do with that leftovers? Well, as I mentioned earlier, if you're on Fort Hood, you know, we have our classification unit, the year round service for Department of Defense ID card holders to dispose of those items properly. So we take those household hazardous items that are listed here and we dispose of it. And if it can be reused, we keep it in the storage facility. So we go back to the three R's that we mentioned to reduce, reuse, and recycle. So if something can be reused, maybe I just didn't like this product, but it can be reused by another family. So, you know, this is also another opportunity as families are incoming military families, they can see what's available and pick that up. Or as families are PCSing and leaving the area, they can't take those cleaning products with them. They can put it there. <clears throat> the other item is that I think a lot of times when you you buy a home or you're, you move into a house and the garage paint suddenly appears and we never know what to do. We just kind of push it into the corner. So that's another opportunity. Um, and as I mentioned with the Central Texas Council of Governments, they do a partnership with the area communities to provide community wide um, events on the weekend on Saturdays to dispose of these items. So another site that you can explore, it's earth911.com, and you can look on there and you can input the item that you're trying to find a facility or venue to recycle an item. So, you know, there's several resources. So if you're in the area, we have resources that are here. If you're not, then explore your municipality's solid waste and recycle program to see what services and opportunities they have for disposal. So we kind of wanted, we looked at the bigger picture and we want to look more in depth to Fort Hood. So, you know, Fort Hood is a permitted municipal separate storm water sewer system. So that is also known as an MS4. It's less of a tongue twister, easier to say. So the MS4 at Fort Hood, you know, it transports storm water through a system of conveyances, pipes, and channels um, that, and, that end up in our local lakes and bodies of water. So we talked about Lake Belton, which we have a lovely picture of the dam with the mural. And that water from the sewer systems and everything we mentioned from the storm drains end up at Lake Belton and it's untreated. So these bodies of water are providing drinking water, wildlife habitats, uh, and recreation for the community. So it serves many different purposes um, for any individual. So the mission statement of the team that Tanika is with, with the clean water program, is for them to ensure that Fort Hood is compliant with federal, state, and local regulations pertaining to municipal stormwater, industrial stormwater, and industrial wastewater. So this is a pretty large footprint that they encompass uh, across Fort Hood. And they accomplish this by implementing several different plans that include the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan, Stormwater Management Plan, and the Spill Prevention Controls and Countermeasures Plan. So a lot of different plans that they have going on um, that they use to execute. And you know, by doing that and having these systems in place, um, they're providing readiness support and they're minimizing the impact to mission capabilities here on Fort Hood. So we also want to give you some background history. So we have Fort Hood and we have the Clean Water Program. And as that water is going there, it's going to Lake Belton. So if you didn't know, Lake Belton is a 12,300 acre impoundment of the Leon River, and it spans across Bell and Coryell counties. So there's numerous creeks, coves, and long penises 
that make the lake very scenic and account for over 100 miles of shoreline. So the dam that we have there, the Belton Dam, was actually constructed by the Army Corps engineers between 1949 to 1954. So we have a couple of black and white photos that kind of just illustrate that process. So the dam is 3,800 feet long, 172 feet high, and it extends all the way to the boundaries of Mother Nest State Park, which was the first park in the state system. So the dam helps to protect the area against floods, as well as provide drinking water to several Central Texas communities, including Fort Hood. So it's one of the largest man-made lakes of its kind, and it also creates a lot of recreation opportunities. So, you know, many soldiers and their families stationed here uh, have heard of Ballora. So that stands for Belton Lake Outdoor Recreation Area. And that's managed by our Director of Morale, Welfare and Recreation. And that provides the opportunity for fishing, boat rentals, docks, picnic areas, and a lot of recreational activities for the family. But we want to make sure that our water is clean and healthy. So that's why we need to do our part uh, to minimize the impact. So Tanika is going to further elaborate about what their program does to help support stormwater initiatives here on Fort Hood. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tanika Avila, and I'm with the DPW Environmental Division, and uh, I oversee a program called the MS4, which, as Christine mentioned, is the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, um, and it encompasses a variety of permits that are issued to Fort Hood from the state, uh, the Industrial Wastewater Permit, the Industrial Stormwater Permit, and uh, we have a construction stormwater. And all of those are a way of making sure that Fort Hood doesn't contribute to polluting public waters. And we manage those by overlooking, uh, not overlooking, overseeing several sites and operations that stormwater in affects. And some of those would be things like uh, washing your, your personally owned vehicles, uh, tactical vehicles when the units uh, come in and go out to the field, uh, fundraising operations, all these things uh, add water and depending on the weather can impact our, our conveyances. Uh, things like street sweeping, landscaping to ensure that our grounds are stabilized and that there isn't so much erosion. Uh, we have a spill response and prevention team uh, vehicle maintenance and materials to make sure that these items are cleaned up and properly managed. Uh, good housekeeping is anything from just making sure that if you do maintenance, you clean up your area and you ensure that nothing is left behind. So like that, if it does rain, uh, we don't have anything going into our storm drains. The MS4 consists of uh, like Christine said before, every conveyance that channels stormwater in a direction. So things like yard waste, if you're gonna mow your yard um, and you don't actually collect it in the bag the lawnmower has, we ask that you not just blow that down into the sidewalk or any of the concrete storm drains because they create clogs, they plug up fence lines, which doesn't allow for proper drainage. Um, they can even get into the storm drain itself. Uh, recycling, making sure that you recycle so that those materials don't end up on the ground or don't end up in our storm drains or that they go exactly where they're supposed to be either recycled or uh, if they can't be recycled in the trash. Food waste uh, belongs in the trash as well or you know, in a proper dumpster, uh, trash and debris. If that's not collected, it can create blockages and stoppages, which doesn't allow water to flow properly, which creates secondary issues like flooding and carrying materials that otherwise wouldn't be uh, where they don't belong. Pet waste, it's, it's not a fertilizer. Um, we make sure that any sediment 
that the units track in or out uh, is properly cleaned up and maintained. Um, things like oils and fuels, just to make sure that that isn't left or residual, um, that it's cleaned up properly. And sewage issues, they're not, they're not our favorite. Uh, if you've lived in Texas for any amount of time, you know that we do encounter some drought weathers, um, sometimes for months long. We're currently in a drought, uh, and we ask that there's no watering from 11 to 6, uh, that we do our part to best manage water, um, just minimizing washing of vehicles, minimizing how often you water your yard, uh, and keeping tabs on the hours of, of best use. Uh, we don't use potable water to wash our driveways. Uh, and just making sure that if there's any leaks or breakages in the pipes that those get reported properly. Um, and then we have a stage two, which makes it mandatory to conserve water uh, between the hours of 10 and seven. And that there's absolutely no water runoff allowed, uh, no washing of POVs, no washing of uh, military vehicles, that if they're going to do that, that they take those to the tactical vehicle wash, uh, emergency vehicles um, are for emergency purposes, and that they be maintained uh, to ensure safety of our public. Uh, we minimize the use of potable water on construction sites and during all construction activities, which just minimizes the amount of dust that's been blown around. And we ask that you not fill up private pools which leads us to another important factor in controlling stormwater and the umbrella of the MS4, which that <clears throat> there not be any illicit discharges. And those are things like leaving vehicle fluids uh, on the ground, which would eventually be washed away with stormwater. We try to minimize that as much as possible. Um, that if there's any breakages in the lines or sanitary issues that those be reported and repaired as soon as possible, uh, that you not discharge oils, fuels, antifreeze, any chemical fluids into the storm drain or the storm system, uh, which is best for all of us, uh, considering where all of those tributaries lead that affects our drinking water. Some of the largest industrial sites on Fort Hood are both airfields, Hood Army Heliport and Robert Gray. Um, those are both fixed wing and blade aircraft uh, rotary. And we have DLADS, which is where all materials that are signed for gets turned into to make sure that those are properly replaced or distributed. Um, we have the DPW classification unit, which is where we ask units to send their used oil or any chemical products so that those can properly be disposed of and classified as waste. Uh, we have a household hazardous waste facility there. That way, if uh, units are PCSing into or out of Fort Hood, uh, that those products, if they are reusable or usable, can be inventoried and stored for the next family that, that could possibly use them. Um, we have our P2 services, which services all units on the installation um, to ensure that we minimize uh, any chemical spills, any industrial chemical spills, uh, such as antifreezes, fuels, oils. And of course, we have the Fort Hood Recycle Center, uh, which plays a very pivotal key role on Fort Hood in minimizing how much, uh, how many materials go into the landfill. All of this is important and plays key roles in our drinking water. Um, and Fort Hood utilizes a separate civilian company uh, by the name of American Water, and they are responsible for repairing uh, any asset that does not belong to DPW and controlling our public water and our drinking waters. Um, they ask that we not 
uh, leave hose, hoses unprotected or in other bodies of water to prevent backflow and that we not touch or remove current uh, installed back, backflow preventers. One of the other key things that is very important to them being able to do their job and for us to all have clean water and not have clogged systems is that we please not dump fat soils and greases into our sinks or drains that if we could please clean off plates, pots, dishes, and dispose of that properly, that uh, we minimize how our drains get plugged. That's never any fun, especially if there's a sewer system uh, and that we dump only the proper items into our to toilets and sinks. So that we have a better understanding of what fog stands for, bats, oils, and greases, uh, here's a diagram that explains basically that we please wash off our pots, uh, anything from cooking oils to vegetable oils, anything that will harden, uh, even coconut oil, fish oils, uh, anything that contains seeds, nuts, fruits, kernels, all of those should be properly disposed of. Do not wash fat soils and greases down the drain. Uh, if you're going to, uh, or if you have large excessive amounts, please let it cool down, let it potentially harden, and then properly dis dispose of that, scrape that into a trash or garbage bin. Um, please avoid as much as possible using the garbage disposal so that we can minimize how many food particles get into our sanitary sewers. Uh, catch basins in larger facilities such as cafeterias and eateries, are essential to keeping food particles out of our sanitary sewer and that we do as much as possible to keep those areas clean and regularly ensure that the areas around us are maintained. So everyone is part of our municipal system. Everyone plays a role. Everyone is key in making sure that we don't litter, we don't throw away recyclable items improperly and that we just maintain our good household practices. So remember that you can do your part to minimize your impact. Keep those fog items out of your sink. When you have those items that you find underneath your sink, in your garage, your shed, properly dispose of those items. Rethink about how you're doing maintenance on your vehicle. Pick up your dog's poop. So all of these little actions add up. And make sure you don't throw any type of cigarette butts or litter out your, your vehicle. And if you see somebody, report them. So see something, say something. We appreciate so, you all. So yeah, so we encourage you to be good stewards in the environment and to share these positive habits uh, with your family, with your friends, and get young children just involved. They show that they can have a strong impact too. So yeah, we appreciate the opportunity to educate the CTC um, community and also anybody that we've connected to virtually. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, you guys are always awesome. I, um, uh, let me ask Alyssa, Alyssa, are there any questions yet? Because I have a ton of them. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You have a ton of questions. I have a ton of questions. Yes, yes. Well, um, okay. Uh, this is for Tanika. Well, both of you guys. Okay, so obviously everybody's doing it wrong <laughs> with this storm water. We've all, you know, there's a lot of driveways here. I see people putting grass cuttings, blowing everything in. So a lot of this has gone already into the lakes. We don't want them. That's why we had this event. We don't want them to go in and you're telling us how to pre prevent it. But already a lot of stuff has gone in there. So are there any ways to clean it up? Like I watch a guy with do metal fishing in, in Wisconsin or somewhere and he's pulling up bicycles. He's pulling up gazillions of metal and everything else. 
So is there any ways that we can clean what's already been messed up? So I will say that there are um, a lot of the local communities. I know like with the city of Harker Heights, they do like um, hikes on trails like at Dana Peak Park, which is near Stillhouse Lake. And so hikers will take the opportunity to go do what we said with plogging. So they'll have a trash bag with them. So, you know, if, if you're doing a hike or exploring somewhere near a waterway, pick up that trash. Um, there's another local group and I can't recall the name, but they go out there with their kayaks. So they're out there in the lakes with their trash containers and they're picking up trash from there. Um, I, a few years ago, I had somebody that went out to Corpus Christi and they had like the netted bags that you get from um, like grapefruit and oranges, like the large bags. And so they were repurposing that um, and putting trash in there so that the water could just come out pretty easily. So you're just getting the litter. So there were things that we do as individuals um, to help just be responsible and be good stewards. So, you know, look for an opportunity to see if there's some type of local group. Um, I know an app that's been used before in a website is called Meetup. So you can find individuals with same similar interests, or you can set up a meetup and say, hey, you know, I want to get a group together to meet at this pond or this lake, and let's do a litter cleanup event. Um, some communities have an adopt a spot program. So, you know, uh, I know in this area, there's like adopt a highway. So to promote the don't mess with Texas trash off, but they have adopt a spot and that spot can be anything. It can be a roadway, it could be a lake, it could be a park. So, you know, explore those opportunities. And if that's not available, then see what you can do to try to help implement that. Um, and get it started. Um, and so, yeah, do your part. Okay, yeah, because I I've gotten into the watching this metal fisher, and I'm going. I've never imagined that there's much, that much metal in water, you know. So, okay. Um, I also have another question. Uh, well, one I know of that there's because uh, I I can get on Fort Hood's base, but you know, there's some people who can't, and I know that clean on Avenue F has uh, a recycle drop off that you can do cardboard and just a little bit of everything. So are y'all, do y'all know if like Harker Heights or Copper's Cove has anything like that for people who can't get on base? So we, we definitely encourage that you reach out directly to community because some of them might have a curbside program. So you know, uh, for example, City of Belton has a curbside recycle program and through their contract with waste management, you can actually call them if you have one of those household hazardous waste items and they will pick it up. Uh, you know, having that household hazardous waste collection facility requires special permits from the state of Texas. Um, so that's why we encourage communities to kind of just explore, follow their municipalities, uh, Facebook page or website, and to look for those Central Texas Council of Government uh, events. So the COG in partnership with one of the communities in Central Texas will host um, this household hazardous waste, sometimes even electronic waste, or even tire recycling event. And this is open to individuals, not only in Bell or Coriel County, but all the counties that the COG support. So that's Slim Passes, San Saba, Mills County. So the footprint is quite wide. So we know that, you know, as a Central Texas region, we're trying to provide as many of those opportunities as possible for communities to, uh, for residents to dispose of those items properly. It could just, just in addition to that, um, right here off Clear Creek, uh, across from or further past Mohawk, uh, Fort Hood has placed a. So, so, <laughs> are you tickled in? So that's actually that's actually the city of Colleen Sorry. that has the the recycle bin. So I stand corrected. <laughs> so, explore. You know, uh, with Colleen, they do have their facility downtown, but they also have facilities that are more easily accessible twenty four seven um, at that Clear Creek site. And then sometimes they also have it at the Clean Special Events Center. So explore, see what those opportunities are. I know a lot of communities are trying to make it as easy as possible um, for individuals just to do the right thing. And a lot of times there's a place for it um, to properly dispose of it the right way and not just put it in the trash. 
Well, and, and just one more question. I'm sorry. I just, y'all brought up so much stuff. Um, you had talked about those rain gardens and you talked about natural plants and one other event that you guys had, it was the butterfly one was talking about natural plants and where do we find this list of Texas natural plants, um, that we can help the environment. So there are a lot of great resources. So I believe there's a website called Texas Smartscape. Um, and if you Google that, that provides a database where you can search another really great resource um, online. But I would also encourage to actually visit. It's the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. So that's in Austin and that's in partnership with the University of Texas. So they have a lot of great visuals that they provide um, and they also have a database so it can give you ideas to see what these plants look like. Um, give you ideas of how to best landscape your space. Um, the Bell County Master Gardeners Association, I know this is a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, if you do a search on them on Facebook, they actually have like a garden expert that you can call like once a week with your garden questions. And they also host native plant cells. So explore your community to see um, if there's something with a garden association, or for us, we have the Texas AgriLife Extension. Sometimes they will also do partnerships for rain barrel, rainwater harvesting workshops, but also information about gardening and those native plants. So there's a lot of resources that are out there, and you have a lot of individuals of different uh, experience levels uh, that can pro help provide you some insight. Wow. Great resources, guys. You know, y'all always bring so much information to us. That's why we love partnering with you. all So, um, well, thank you so much, both of you, um, for taking the time in the middle of the day here and coming, um, coming and having this virtual event with us. You are like a wealth of information. And I actually got a tour of all their facilities over there. And it's like, if you're able to get on, Fort Hood, you need to go see this because I was like, wow, wow, y'all are doing so much for our environment that, you know, it's just unreal. So definitely um, can, if they ever have any questions, I mean, you could definitely put it on our Facebook here, but, you know, just call on over there. And there's so many people that have so much information that, um, I mean, y'all got to an answer everything. If we do, we do have the experts that we can reach out to. So we do have a, 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 a wider a variety of the experiences and backgrounds um, that help us just be successful in what we do every day. Okay, thank well, you for great. this opportunity. Well, well, thank you. Before we go, guys, I want to remind you guys of some events. We have tomorrow at noon, we've got our uh, CTC astronomer. Warren Hart, he's going to be doing the night sky tour for October. We don't forget, we also have next Monday philosophy and popcorn. Basically, you come, we give you some questions, you answer it for what's true to you. There's no debate, you, no judgment, no talking about it. And if you feel angry about what somebody says, just eat the popcorn. And it's basically a way to hear from other people's point of view, and it's also great listening skills. So that's at four o'clock uh, next Monday. Also, we have next Monday at noon, we have uh, former mayor and city councilman, Jose Segarra, who is going to be here at the library. He's gonna be talking about his life story. He's also gonna be talking about the importance of voting. So make sure that you come on over for him. And then we have another Fort Hood event on October 5th, and that is um, our Texas Archaeology Month with uh, archaeologist Sonny Wood from Fort Hood. He'll be back, and I skipped over one. On October the 3rd, we have um, Professor Bass and Professor Craig, who is doing a very interesting discussion panel. It'll be at the library for the discussion panel on transhumanism. Transhumanism is replacing body parts 
and enhancing people to live longer. So this should be an interesting discussion on their part. That will be in person and our archeology span month will be a virtual again. So lots of interesting events. Um, guys, check it all out. It's on our events page. So um, everyone, thank you guys for tuning in. We love having you. We love having you ladies coming. And um, we've seen Christine so many times and we have a mysterious Timmy who shows up. <laughs> so we just always expect Timmy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, guys, you have an awesome day and we will see you next time. So, Alyssa, if you will take us out and um, you guys don't leave yet.